Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fourth and final webinar in our Wild Isles series, our marvellous marine birds. This webinar is going to be an hour long with talks and videos from some of our experts uh, before I give you the chance to ask your questions in the Q&A session at the end. My name is Ness Amara Rogers, and I'm the Senior Science Comms Executive for the RSPB, which is a very long winded way of me saying that I work with our scientific uh, programme and get to tell their amazing stories to our members, our supporters and other people. So our speakers this afternoon are Laura Bambini and Zoe Deakin. Um, but before we hear from them, we've got some important online housekeeping just to make you aware of. So as this is a web Zoom now, you're not going to be able to turn on your video or microphone, but you will be able to ask questions using the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. We may not get time to answer all people's questions during the session, but we will try to get back to you at a further date if you haven't asked it anonymously. Please don't wait until the end of the presentation to ask your questions, but pop them in the Q&A box as soon as you think of them. And to help us know who the question is for, just put the speaker's name at the beginning of your question. Just to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and there's going to be some polls this afternoon. So these are going to pop up on your screens automatically. I'll give you a bit of a, a heads up when they're about to. And it'd be really great if you could answer them, but please don't feel like you have to. There's also going to be a survey at the end, which is going to also pop up on your screens automatically once the webinar has ended. And it would be really great to get your feedback on how you thought this webinar went. But again, don't feel obliged that you have to take part. If you are having any technical issues, there's someone on the from the events team with us today who will be able to help. Um, although for some Zoom related issues, we might not be able to offer any support. Now to introduce our first speaker. So our first speaker is Laura Bambini, and she's the RSPB Scotland Senior Seabird Recovery Officer and specialises in island restoration. She's worked on islands all around the world on projects to protect threatened island fauna and flora, including here today in the UK. Today, she's here to tell us about the Manx Shearwater, a seabird that only breeds on islands. But before I hand over to Laura, we've got our first poll. So a quick question is, did you know that there are things that you can do to help biosecurity when uh, visiting a seabird island? So I'll give you a minute to answer. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. So we're not going to give you the answer right now, but Emma's going to, um, uh, sorry, we'll share the results during Laura's presentation. So Laura, over to you. Thank you. Just uh, sharing my screen. Hopefully that looks all right for you. So, Thanks for that introduction. Um, it's great to be here today to tell you about the Manx Shearwater, one of our truly marvellous seabirds. So those of you who watched the Wild Isles series and saw David Attenborough share a moment with the Manx Shearwater on Skoma Island know that they don't really look like this, but this old illustration from a bird book um, I think quite neatly illustrates that we didn't really know much about these birds before, um, but there were lots of stories and legends around. Um, so in this presentation today, I'll shed a little light into what we know about the Manx Shearwater today, why the UK is so important for this species globally. Um, we'll talk about the threats the species faces, but we'll focus on the things we can and are doing to help the Manx Shearwater and our other seabirds. So the Manx Shearwater is truly pelagic. It means it, that means it only comes to land to breed and it does so under cover of darkness. This is to avoid predators because they're very clumsy on land, so they're easy prey 
In the evenings of late spring and summer, they gather in large rafts uh, just offshore from their breeding colonies on islands where they wait for dark um, before they return to their burrows. And on predator free islands, they form absolutely vast colonies, which are really noisy places at night. And their strange calls can be heard over a really long distance um, at sea, inspiring flights of fancy, such as what we see here uh, on this slide, which is from Waldron's story in the description of Isle of Man, a book from 1731. Now, even though the colonies are very noisy during the night, they're completely silent during the day and all the birds are underground. But people knew, of course, about these colonies existing um, and they used to go there and harvest the chicks, which are confusingly called puffins. Um, on this slide, we can see a description of harvests from the calf of man. This is from John Ray's book from 1678. Uh, and seabirds were an important part of the diet of islanders all around the UK historically. And even today, uh, Max Shearwater chicks are still taken on the Azores and in the Faroes. So what do we know about the birds themselves? Um, an adult Max Shearwater weighs about 400 grams, which is similar to weight to a wood pigeon. But contrast to a wood pigeon, they have Sort of long slender bodies and long tapery wings uh, with a wingspan of around 80 centimetres. They're really long-lived birds. From ringing recoveries, we know that they can live to over 50 years of age. Um, they only start breeding when they're around six years old, but youngsters can start coming back to their colonies um, from sort of their second year onwards. And this is where they find their mates. Um, and once it's time to breed, both parents look after the, the single young. Um, Manx Shearwater mostly feeds on small pelagic fish like sardines, sprat and herring, but also squid, crustaceans and offal. Um, and they get their name, Shearwater, from the way they fly. They're sort of shearing and banking, flying quite close to the ocean surface. They, they take advantage of the winds and air currents and can travel hundreds and hundreds of miles on their foraging trips. Um, and they leave the chick there waiting to, to be fed, sometimes for, for days at a time. Um, and at the end of the breeding season, they leave our shores and they head to the coasts of South America, which is a round trip of over 10,000 miles. So in fact, in its lifetime, an adult Manx Shearwater will have covered easily around a million miles, which is really impressive. Now we know all this from tracking studies and from studying birds that have been caught. But because of their elusive habits on land, Manx Shearwaters are actually really tricky to count. So we don't exactly know how many there are breeding here on the, in the UK. And we don't quite know where they are either. Um, we know where the biggest colonies are, of course, but we think there are still some relic populations persisting in the Northern Isles of Scotland and on islands off the west coast of Scotland. Uh, we think that around a third of the UK population is on rum in Scotland. Um, and over 50% will be on the islands in, in Pembrokeshire. There are other important populations, for instance, on Bardsey, Lundy, St Kilda, Trashnish Isles and the Copelands. Um, but in terms of absolute numbers, we're not quite sure. We think somewhere between 300 and 600,000 pairs over the last 20 years. We're just waiting now for the results of the latest census to be released. So soon we'll have a much more accurate picture. What we do know, however, that at least 80% of the global population of Manx Shearwaters breeds right here in the UK. And we have the world's, world's largest colony in Pembrokeshire. So these islands are incredibly different, incredibly important for the Manx Shearwaters. Now, these are really tough times for all our marine life as the impacts of climate change they hold. Our oceans are not in a good health at the moment and our seabirds are struggling. The Manx Shearwater 
face those multiple threats at sea where they spend most of their life. And because they're long lived, pollution is one of the problems they face. Um, heavy metals and other pollutants, uh, organochlorine compounds accumulate in their tissues. Uh, they get it from their food sources. Um, and, and yeah, this stays, stays with the adults. Uh, offshore wind farms is another issue that they can cause um, collision uh, or they can cause displacement for the foraging areas. Um, Shearwaters also get caught in fishing gear, particularly long lines um, and gill nets. We don't exactly know how many are affected in the UK each year, um, but for other shearwater species, we do know that this is a big problem. Light pollution can also be a problem. It can lead to stranding of fledglings. They get distracted by coastal lighting and fly in the wrong direction. Um, last year, sadly, we also found the highly pathogenic avian influenza in Manx waters here in the UK. This is really worrying because we've seen what it's done to other seabirds like gannets and uh, great skewers. However, by far the biggest threat this species faces is predation on land by introduced non-native mammals. The cats and rats on islands have led to the loss of a number of colonies here in the UK, including from the calf of man, where we know from old accounts from those harvests that they used to take about four, around 4,000 chicks every year. So it must have been a very, very large colony. And this was prior to the arrival of rats. And when rats got there, um, the birds all but disappeared. We also know that in the last century or so, we will have lost at least 12 colonies uh, around Scotland in, in this way. But there is hope. This is a threat we can tackle. So the eradication of rats and other mammalian predators from islands has benefited seabirds from the world over. This map shows uh, the grey dots are eradications around the world. Uh, you can see here that it's um, it's becoming a very commonplace uh, conservation um, action now. Here in the UK, the red dots on this map show where we have in the last 20 to 30 years um, focused eradication efforts to create habitat for Manx shearwater. And these, these operations are really complex and expensive, but they do lead to some very impressive results. So following a rat eradication a few years ago now um, from St Agnes and Kew in the Isles of Scilly, we are seeing Manx shearwater numbers increasing year on year. On Landy Island in the Bristol Channel, where the birds have had over 20, around 20 years now to recover, we've seen a 15-fold increase in the number of of birds breeding there. Um, and a similar story is unfolding on Ramsey Island in Wales. Now these were populations where some birds were still remaining at the time when the rats were removed and they can recover by themselves. But even if birds have been completely lost from an island, we can try to bring them back by providing artificial nest boxes um, and using uh, bird calls to attract them to come and investigate um, nesting opportunities on that island. But once the birds have been lost, even when the island is once again suitable for breeding for them, it can take them a really long time to come back, decades even. Now, at the start of this, we asked you um, to answer a quick poll question. So if we could share the results now, It'll be really interesting to see. Okay, so we asked you, did you know that there are things that you can do to help biosecurity when visiting a seabird island? And 61% of you said that you did, which is great news. Um, what are we talking about here with biosecurity? Well, let me tell you, biosecurity is one of our sort of more, one of our newer areas of work, and it's really exciting because 
everyone can get involved in biosecurity. And it's great to see that so many of you have heard about biosecurity because it's far easier and cheaper to keep islands predator free in the first place. We're discovering that incursions can and do happen quite frequently on our seabird islands. And even a single animal can really cause devastation in a seabird colony. Um, but if it happens to be a pregnant female rat, within eight months, that can lead to a population of 300 rats and they'll simply take over the island. Um, and in this instance, we do lose our seabirds. And sadly, we are the unwitting transporters of many of these predators. But simple checks of bags, cargo and boats prior to travel to seabird islands can make a big difference to our seabirds. So through this Save Our Seabirds campaign, which has been running for the last three to four years, um, we've been encouraging people to, to do these checks and get involved. And we've actually reached out to over 10 million people and this work is ongoing. So we're hoping really that biosecurity becomes business as usual on our seabird islands. Because there is a role for everyone in island biosecurity. It's about managing risk and every little step we take will reduce that overall risk. And island communities in particular have a key role to play in biosecurity because they often transport high risk goods like bulky cargo or animal feed. So we know that rodents in particular can travel around in these. So we've developed training materials and guidance um, to help people learn about these simple checks and measures they can take. And we've even co-designed uh, an education package for primary school children so that kids can start learning about uh, seabirds and how we can protect them with simple biosecurity measures. But whilst awareness is important and vigilance helps, we also need action on the ground. So we've actually trained hundreds of island managers, residents and volunteers to carry out these checks and implement biosecurity on their islands. So we've helped our biosecurity heroes to set up surveillance networks, including those that are home to our important populations of Manx Shearwater. And if anything happens to get through these checks, we're now better than ever before able to respond. We've trained volunteers to, to do uh, incursion responses. We've stocked up incursion hubs with all the equipment we need, and we've trained a conservation detection dog to help us with this effort. And thanks to all our efforts, from very little biosecurity at the start of the Biosecurity for Life project, we now have 95% coverage of our internationally important seabird islands. Um, they all have biosecurity and we know that the seabirds there are safeguarded. And we work continues now to uh, extend this biosecurity coverage to all our sites. Saving nature requires collaboration and there's been lots and lots of organisations and individuals and funders involved in this work. Um, here is just a small selection of them. If you'd like to know more about this work that we do um, and how to get involved, here's a few websites to get you started. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Laura. That was absolutely brilliant. So really, really great to learn about Manx Water and the conservation work that's going on to help them. And obviously it is such a big piece of work. And like you say, so many partners involved. Just really, really great to hear what's going on. So thank you. Um, and thank you, everybody. There's been some amazing questions coming in already, but do feel free to keep popping your questions in the Q&A box for Laura um, as we go on.
So now we're going to hear from Zoe. So Zoe is in um, the RSPB Centre for Conservation Science. She's one of our conservation scientists. Uh, her research focuses on identifying threats to seabirds and then working towards solutions to seabird conservation problems. So before I hand over to Zoe, we have our second poll. Um, and I want to find out here, who here has ever heard of a storm petrel before today? Uh, so I'm just going to give you a minute to answer that question. I think that's long enough. So if we can share the results. Oh, okay. I'm actually quite surprised by this. So 68% um, of people have said, yes, I've heard of storm petrels, but never seen one. So we obviously have a very um, bird, uh, you know, good bird knowledge group of people listening in. And some of you have even seen one in real life, which is absolutely amazing. So for those of you who haven't heard about what a storm petrel is, we've got Zoe, who's going to be giving her presentation right now. So over to you, Zoe. Thank you, Ness. OK, hopefully you can now see my screen. So yeah, I'm going to be talking about a couple of projects that we've been working on within the science department where we've been using new technology to monitor some of our lesser known seabirds. So when I tell people that I work with seabirds, the conversation often turns to talk of our most charismatic species like puffins and gannets, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. But a lot of my work focuses on a group of seabirds that many people have never heard of, let alone seen. But obviously today you are bucking that trend and lots of you have heard of storm petrels, which is brilliant. Um, but let's learn a little bit more about them now. So storm petrels are members of a group of seabirds called the Procellariforms or tube noses. And this group includes the huge albatrosses, which might have a 12 foot wingspan, um, as well as the petrels and shearwaters. And in the UK, we've got four species of Procellariform that breed. We've got two species of storm petrel, plus the former, which is probably the one that you're most likely to have seen if you've been out and about on our coasts. And then there's the Manx Shearwater, which you're all now experts on after Laura's talk. So our two breeding storm petrels are the European storm petrel on the left here. And this is the Atlantic Ocean's smallest seabird. It's just a little bit bigger than a house sparrow. And then we've also got the leeches petrel, which is slightly larger, similar in size to a starling. And storm petrels, like Manx shearwaters, are really pelagic seabirds. So they spend almost all their lives at sea and they only come to land to breed. So these maps show uh, their breeding locations, which are really at the extreme margins of the British Isles. And the photos along the bottom just show a few of the places that they nest. So these are birds living right on the edge. And with very good reason, because being so small, storm petrels are very vulnerable, like the Manx Shearwaters, to predation, both from mammals like rats, um, but also larger seabirds like gulls and skewers. And as well as nesting in some of our most remote locations, they also nest out of sight in burrows and cavities, and they only enter or leave the colony under the cover of darkness. So the video in the top right here is taken at night using thermal imagery, and it's, you can just about see some light coloured storm petrels moving to and from their nest sites in this boulder beach. And while these behaviours 
really add to the mystery and fascination of these little birds, they also make them incredibly difficult to study. But this is where new technology is proving very useful. So for the first project, we're off to the island of Musa, and this is a reserve in Shetland that's managed by the RSPB, and it's home during the breeding season to the UK's largest colony of European storm petrels, with around 11,000 breeding pairs at the last count. And we've been working on Musa to test a new method for monitoring our breeding storm petrels in the hope that it can be used at colonies or parts of colonies um, that are much more difficult for people to get to. So while you could walk around Musa during the daytime and have no idea that there are thousands of storm petrels nestled in the walls and beaches, at night the island comes alive with a very strange purring and chirruping storm petrel song. And the sound has been likened to that of a fairy being sick. So let's see what you think. I'm going to show you some footage from Musa Brock, which is the Iron Age Tower you can see in the photo here. And amazingly, um, the walls of Musa Brock are home to hundreds of nesting storm petrels. So let's take a, look, a look at it during the night. So I hope you could hear that. It's definitely a very strange sound, but I'm not sure about the fairy being sick description myself. So last summer, we set up these little audio recorders called audio moths um, at different distances from walls on Musa to see how far away the calls from the birds could be heard. And we're testing whether the calls of storm petrels recorded by these devices can give us a good idea of the number of nests in an area and how many of those are successful in producing chicks. And to find out how many nests the walls actually contain, we have to have a little chat with the storm petrels themselves. So we play a storm petrel call from a speaker and we listen for birds responding from within the wall. And that sounds something a bit like this. <laughs> And we can then compare the number of nests that we found with the number of natural nighttime calls that have been recorded on our sound recorders. We had also planned to record the cheeping of chicks later in the season to give us an idea of breeding success, but unfortunately the worsening avian flu outbreak last year meant that we had to cut our research short um, just to protect um, the rest of Moose's seabirds from any additional risk. But luckily, we still collected some useful data. And my colleague Sophie Bennett is currently busy analysing the recordings and is preparing to return to Musa to collect more data this summer. But so far, the results are looking really encouraging. Um, and hopefully in the future, we can use these recorders to monitor areas um, that humans can't get to. So that's one way that we might be able to monitor store at their colonies, but for birds that spend the majority of their time at sea, it's important to understand where they're going and what they're doing in the marine environment so that we can identify current or future threats that they might face there. But observing a tiny sparrow-sized seabird on the open ocean is pretty tricky, and there's constants as you're about to find out, so following them at sea is not really feasible. Thankfully for us, Tracking technology has now become small enough to deploy on these species and we've got these little GPS devices that weigh less than a gram and these work just like the GPS in your phone or your sat nav so they use information from satellites to record a location and we can set these to record a location say every 15 minutes during a bird's foraging trip. So for the next project, I'm going to whisk you off to St Kilda, where the majority of the UK's leeches petrels breed. And leeches petrels have been declining at a really alarming rate on both sides of the Atlantic. And this has led to them being classed as globally vulnerable on the IUCN red list and critically endangered in the UK in the recent Birds of Conservation Concern Assessment. 
But the causes of these declines are not currently very well understood, so we've got lots of work to do. My colleagues Mark Bolton and Connie Tremlett spent six weeks on St Kilda in the summer of 2021, trekking up and down on a nightly basis to the breeding colony of leeches petrels out on the cliffs. And then when they were there, they located nests and they captured birds as they left to begin their foraging trips and deployed these tiny GPS tags to follow the birds' movements. Then, when the birds returned from their trips, they were recaptured and the tags removed to recover the data. And this is the first time that leeches petrels have ever been tracked in the UK, so you're probably some of the first people to see where these birds have been going. So what did we find? Well, firstly, and really importantly, monitoring of the nests where birds were and weren't tagged showed that there was no detectable difference between the behaviour of tagged and untagged birds. And this is really important from a welfare point of view, of course, we don't want to cause any harm to these birds. But also because for the data to be useful, we need to make sure we're recording natural movements and behaviours. We're not interested in seeing where a bird goes if it's only going there because we've put a tag on it. So the tracked birds spent two or three days at sea on each trip, and all of them used an area of ocean to the north and west of St Kilda. So each different colour you see here is a, a different individual bird. During incubation, the parents take it in turns to forage out at sea while their partner sits on the egg for a few days at a time. And at this time, birds travelled on average 300 kilometres from the colony and around 1,000 kilometres in total on each trip, which is pretty incredible for a bird the size of a starling out on the open ocean. Once the egg has hatched, the chick can be left alone in the nest after just a few days and both adults will be out at sea foraging. And at this stage, the adults not only have to feed themselves, but also their chick, which is rapidly growing and probably begging for food. So they have to return to the colony more often. And the trips during this time were slightly shorter, about 800 kilometres in total, but I think still pretty impressive. And if we look at the tracks of the leeches petrels in relation to sea depth, so the dark blue areas here are water that's more than a thousand metres deep. We can see that these birds are deep water specialists, so they're mainly using deep water and they're following the edge of the continental slope. So while this was going on in on St Kilda, um, my colleagues Saskia and Darren were on Lunga in the Treshnish Isles in the Inner Hebrides, and they were using the same type of GPS tags to track European storm petrels. And again, they found no evidence that the tags were having any negative impact on the birds, which is really brilliant. And there were some clear differences from the leeches petrel tracks. So firstly, although trips by European storm petrels during incubation lasted two or three days, which was the same as the leeches petrels, the smaller European stormies stayed much closer to the colony. So they ranged up to 140 kilometers from the colony on average and each trip was about 550 kilometres in total, so about half the distance covered by the leeches petrels during incubation. And then once their chicks had hatched, each foraging trip was one or two days, and the distances covered were slightly shorter again, about 300 kilometres per trip. And whereas the leeches petrels were really focused on the deep water areas, all the European storm petrels stayed over the relatively shallow waters of the continental shelf. And as well as just telling us where the birds are going, these data can also help us understand what they're getting up to when they're there. So when seabirds are travelling to a foraging area, they tend to fly in a relatively straight line and move pretty quickly. Then once they found a patch of food or an area that's good for foraging, they'll need to slow down to look for food and their track will have more twists and turns as they search the area and pause to pick food items from the sea surface. If they rest on the sea for a bit, which they do sometimes do, they won't really be moving much but just drifting on the current. And each of these behaviours shows up as a different pattern in the data recorded by the GPS devices. 
So we end up with a series of dots, which look a bit like these. And by collecting these data on the movements and behavior of birds at sea, we can look at whether and how they're using areas where there are plans to develop offshore wind farms, for example. So the map on the left here shows areas where wind farms already exist or are under construction or are proposed for the future. So our seas are looking quite busy if you think of it like that. And we can also use data from satellites to look at the environmental conditions in the areas the birds are using. And this helps us understand what sort of habitats they're targeting or how their movements or behavior might change in different weather conditions. So these are all ongoing projects and we've still got lots more to learn. We were due to return to St Kilda and Lunga last summer for more work, but again, the avian flu situation meant that this wasn't possible. So we're nervously awaiting the breeding season now but hoping to be able to return to Musa, St Kilda and Lunga this summer to continue with all of this research, which will hopefully provide really crucial information for understanding the needs of these amazing little birds and ultimately help us develop effective conservation solutions to any threats they might face. Now, science doesn't happen by itself, so I just want to give a shout out to everyone who's been working on these projects or helped to facilitate them in some way. We're grateful to the Europe European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, who funded the tracking work I presented, and to Marine Scotland, which is part of the Scottish Government, which is funding the next phase of our tracking. And thank you very much for listening. I hope some of you are leaving with a new favourite seabird, but if you need any more convincing, then do drop a question in the Q&A box. And just finally, before I go, um, I appreciate that the work I presented here probably sounds pretty inaccessible and not the sort of thing that you can easily get involved in. But there are absolutely ways that you can help our seabirds from the comfort of your own home. So if you've watched the Saving Our Wild Isles film on iPlayer, you will have heard David Attenborough talking about the critical importance of sand eels for many of our seabirds and how the current decline in these fish is having devastating impacts on our seabird populations. So. Sand eels are not only affected by climate change, but every year industrial trawlers are removing hundreds of thousands of tons of sand eels from the North Sea to, to turn into feed for farm animals. But there is now some hope. So DEFRA have launched a consultation last month proposing a ban of sand eel fishing in English waters. And this is where your voice can really make a difference. So if you can, please scan the QR code here and add your support to back the ban. And we'll also send you a link to the form in our follow up email after today, after today's event. So keep an eye out for that. But this could be a real game changer for species like puffins and kittiwakes at, at a time when they need it more than ever. So huge thank you to anyone who's already signed. And I really encourage the rest of you to do so. that was absolutely brilliant thank you so much and what a question to ask people to pick between the two for their favorite seabird <laughs> I feel that's quite mean <laughs> um but yeah just really great to hear about all these monitoring techniques and what you're learning from them so it's really really important work um so thank you everyone just don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A box for Zoe um I'm gonna welcome Laura back um, and then we'll, it's ready for the Q&A. So we've got we've got Laura here. Um, so some really, really good questions. Uh, so I'm going to start off by asking the question from uh, Emma um, and also Bill. Actually, I think that they're sort of quite linked quite nicely. So this is for Laura. Um, are there any Manx Shearwater on the Isles of Scilly and any on the Shiant? Isles, Shant Isles. Excellent question. Um, yes and no are the answers. So there are some Manx Shearwaters left on many of the, or, or on a few of the islands um, in the Isles of Scilly. And this is one of the places where we have removed rats from an island to create a, a suitable breeding site for them. And um, so we're actually quite excited about watching the numbers go up now in the Isles of Scilly. Um, the Shants is another place where we've removed rats to make habitat available for the Manx water. 
but we had already lost a bird star, unfortunately. So as I mentioned in my presentation, it can take a really long time to bring them back. So efforts are ongoing to attract them back to the Shenspa, as as for now, none, none are found there. Thank you. So fingers crossed, hopefully at some point they'll come back. Great. Um, a question for Zoe now. Uh, so you've kind of, I, I think you touched on it a little bit at the end, but what are the two species of storm petrel feeding on? So obviously sundial is a really important one, like you've already mentioned, but do they feed on anything else? And this is from Doug. Okay, thank you, Doug. Good question. Um, so sundials, storm petrels aren't specifically feeding on sundials like birds like kittiwakes and puffins, which are much more reliant on them. Um, they'll actually eat much smaller things. So they've got an amazing way of feeding, which I haven't got a video off to show you, but I would have liked to have a look on YouTube if, if you want to see it. But they they patter on the water with their feet. So it looks like they're walking on the water and they sort of use their feet as anchors in the sea surface. And then they'll just reach down and pick up tiny morsels. So they'll be eating things like plankton, crustaceans, tiny fish. Um, we don't know a huge amount about their diet in the UK, but we have been collecting some samples to analyse. Um, but they will eat all sorts. And they'll also take, um, they might feed off other dead animals that are floating on the sea um, or offal. So European storm petrels in particular might follow fishing boats to feed on the discards that are coming off of those. But yeah, they will eat anything. They've also been found to have eaten like terrestrial insects. So things like moths that you'd expect to find on land that have maybe been blown out to sea and they've managed to pick them up there. Um, and even dolphin DNA has been found in storm petrel <laughs> feces, which is quite remarkable. But obviously this is from where they're feeding on a carcass of a dolphin um, on the sea. But yeah, they'll take all sorts. Wow, that's amazing. So, so people are sort of finding their poo I guess and then sort of doing DNA analysis on what they're eating yeah exactly so we take their BC samples where we can and then yeah using PCR like you've probably heard of with the COVID tests you can amplify that DNA and work out who it belongs to that's brilliant I think that's a whole presentation in itself isn't it <laughs> it's very cool um we've got one for another one for Laura so Laura Christine is asking why Manx shearwater when the Isle of Man isn't a main breeding site indeed another good question um well they used to be on the Isle of Man and in fact historically the Manx shearwater was known as the puffin of the Isle of Man and um, so I reckon it was just where they sort of knew about the species and it became associated with that. And then when it was later named, renamed Shearwater, it, it became the, the Manx Shearwater. And it is a bit of a confusing because the Latin name is Puffin Puffinus, is puffinus, that right? Puffinus, 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 puffinus. yes. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not the Puffin. Not the Puffin. <laughs> very confusing. Um, brilliant. Um, so... We'll go to um, questions from Alan uh, asking, do all of the offshore wind farms create a hazard for these seabirds? So very good, very important question. Um, I guess it's probably one for both of you, but maybe Zoe might want to start. Yeah, so this is this is quite a timely um, question because our offshore wind industry is massively expanding at the moment. Um, and there's tons of research going on. RSPB is involved in a lot of research looking into the impacts of offshore wind on our seabirds. So there are sort of three main ways that seabirds might be affected. So obviously there's the direct impact of birds colliding with turbines, which can injure them or, or kill them. Um, but there's also issues around um, displacement from foraging areas. So if a wind farm is put in a really important foraging area for seabirds they might then not be able to use that area they might completely avoid it or perhaps the wind farm causes a barrier to their usual route to their foraging area so they're having to travel further to get to their food supply um, and it really varies between species but storm petrels in particular so I don't know if you remember from the maps of the storm petrel breeding sites around the UK, but they're mostly on the west coast of the UK. And most of the wind farms so far are, are on the east coast. Um, so we haven't seen yet what impact um, they might have on storm petrels or Manx shearwaters. But um, shearwaters and storm petrels tend to fly close to the sea surface, although they may um, fly higher in certain conditions. 
Um, so we're hoping that they'll avoid direct collision because of these lower flight heights. But one thing that we're quite worried about and that we don't have much information on is the fact that um, both Manxes and storm petrels are can be disorientated by light, as Laura mentioned, and these wind farms are really lit up quite brightly for safety and navigation purposes. So there's concern that birds might be drawn into the sort of the area of the rotors and that might increase the risks that they're that they're causing. But at the moment, we really don't know for these species. So hopefully lots more research to come on that. Brilliant. Thanks, Zoe. Um, Laura, anything else to add? Or that was quite comprehensive from Zoe, wasn't it? I'll move on then. Um, so uh Okay, so another question about where Manx shearwaters are. Um, so are there any Manx shearwaters on either the Isle of Man, uh, Calf of Man, or Chicken Rock? I've never even heard of Chicken Rock. That's brilliant. <laughs> chicken Rock sounds great. Uh, I'm afraid I haven't heard of it either. Um, so can't help with that one. Um, on Isle of Man, as far as I know, they, they're no longer there. Uh, on Calf of Man... There are still some remaining. Um, I'm not sure what the count is currently, but on Calf of Man, there's been efforts made to control or remove the, the rats that are predating on, on those birds. And, and the rats are, are thought to be the cause why the colony was um, declined so dramatically. So if we can remove that pressure, then we can expect that the numbers are starting to go up. But yeah, there, there are still some left on Calf of Man. Hanging on. Um, question for Zoe. Could you, from Oliver, could you explain how the audio data analysis is performed? Uh, no. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, you'd have to speak to my colleague, um, Sophie Bennett, but she's basically using some clever way of identifying, um, sort of automating the process, because we've got hours and hours of audio recordings that have been taken overnight on Musa. So she's found a way to sort of automatically identify these storm petrol calls amongst any other sound that's on those recordings. And then, yeah, we're, the idea is that we'll look at sort of um, how many calls are in an area, say, with a really a high number of storm petrol nests. Is, is there a higher number of calls recorded there than somewhere, for example, with very few nests? Can we tell the difference just from these natural um, nighttime recordings? But the details of the analysis is not something I know about. You'd have to speak to my colleague, Sophie. He's doing a great job analysing that. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Zoe. Um, I'm going to send, ask a, que a general question now, actually, which is coming from Anne, and it's a really good question, which is why only breeding on islands? I can take this one. Um, so actually all our burrow nesting species, so the two small petrels that we heard about today and the Manx water, as well as the puffin, um, are all really vulnerable to predation by introduced non-native mammals. Um, particularly the shearwaters and the petrels, they just can't coexist really with these predators. Um, and this is the reason why they're restricted to islands. So islands are naturally free of mammals because mammals can't really get there under their own steam. So they provide safe places for these birds to, to breed. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question uh, from Carolyn. I'm going to ask it because it's absolutely fascinating, but we might not know the answer, but we'll give it a go. So is it true that people living on islands off the coast of Scotland used oil taken from the feathers and bodies of seabirds killed as a wound dressing, which caused many cases of tetanus among the population? This is just brilliant. And I'm going to Google it afterwards if we if we can't if we don't know the answer today. <laughs> I think this might be a job for Google. Sounds plausible, though. They definitely used oils and feathers and I think all, all parts of the birds for some unusual purposes in our eyes, certainly. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Sorry about that. We don't know that we don't know the answer to that one, but uh, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll look at that. Um, 
So some uh, so Doug's asked, are mink much of a problem? So again, that's sort of linking into the the inability to be to cope with predators on mainland. So do mink ever get across to the islands? They can do. Mink are really good swimmers. Um, so they could potentially swim by, by themselves. Um, I don't think we've had so far problems with mink in Maxia water colonies, fingers crossed. But again, this is something where biosecurity will help. So obviously our surveillance devices will detect if anything comes across and then we can respond quickly before too much damage gets done. Um, oh, a good one for you, Laura. Uh, how receptive slash supportive have wildlife tour operators been to biosecurity measures? Do any of them participate directly in surveillance and or offer interpretation to their guests? Great question. Um, they've actually been brilliant. All, all the boat operators we, we work with, uh, especially the ones who's of, who it is their business to take people to Seabird Islands, so obviously, there's a there's a financial interest for them to do, for these places to be thriving and full of seabirds um, and really encouragingly actually many of them see biosecurity as some it, it's it's like a badge of honor you know they can they can show that they're responsible operators and that it gives them something else to talk about to their visitors that come to these places. It's an interesting subject to talk about, and there's always that element of everyone's got a role and responsibility. So it's a good way to to engage with people. So yeah, we've had really really good responses actually, and we're looking forward to working more with with both operators all around the UK. Great, thank you very much. Um, question for Zoe from Rachel. Um, I didn't quite pick up how you could tell the trackers didn't affect the birds and their behaviour. Yeah, so I didn't go into this in detail, but it is something that we look at very carefully. So we have some nests where we're tracking one of the adults um, for a short time. And then we also monitor nests where we're not doing any tracking. Um, and by doing this, we can compare things like um, chick survival rate and chick growth rate. So a lot of small seabird chicks will die before they reach fledging. And we can compare whether there's any difference between the nests where we have tagged and haven't tagged birds so we don't obviously want to see any increase in mortality at, at nests where we have tracked which is is not what we find which is great so um that doesn't seem to be an issue and we also look at things like how long a bird is away on a foraging trip so um if, if you put a tag on it and it suddenly disappears for a week, whereas its normal foraging trip might only be two or three days, then we'd be quite concerned. But actually what we see is that they're, they're spending the same amount of time at sea, whether or not they've got the tag on. So it's things like that that we use. Um, but yeah, it, it's um, we have to be very careful and make sure we're not causing any disturbance or harm. So, and it's worth pointing out that we do that with quite a few different sort of species when we're doing these tagging, uh, tagging and tracking projects is making sure that there's no impacts of the tags on these birds because, you know, we, we don't want that basically. Um, great. Thank you. Um, so uh, this one hasn't got a name next to it, but it's another one for Laura. Uh, how often does it actually happen that a rat is found on a boat or an island? I love these questions. Um, it happens more often than we realised. Uh, so the honest answer is that we haven't been looking for very long. Um, like I said in my presentation, biosecurity is something that we've come to quite recently. So we haven't been collecting data on things like um, in interception rates on, on vessels. Uh, we anecdotally, we hear stories of people finding mice or rats on on their vessels as they're sailing out. Um, there's been uh, at least two incidences where I, uh, where there's been a mouse found on the boat that's bound for St Kilda. Uh, that was obviously turned back. Um, so we, we hear these stories uh, constantly. Uh, we also have heard stories of people finding rats and mice in their, in their bags or in their camping gear. Um, but through the work that we're now doing and we're you know, getting a bit more systematic in our approach to biosecurity, um, I can say that over the five last five years, we've had over 30 suspected incidents uh, on our internationally important seabird islands. And then there's only 42 
of these that we're really focusing our efforts on. So if you think over five years, 42 islands or island groups, over 30 incidents, when we're only just starting to look, I, I think that gives, gives an idea. And similarly, over the last five years, we've had to respond on seven occasions where there has been a predator on island and we've had to respond and remove it. So it could be alarmingly common, we just don't quite have the full picture yet. Great, thank you, Laura. Um, another question for Zoe this time, um, and quite a topical one, saying, have storm petrels been affected by bird flu? A very good question. Um, this is not something we know much about at the moment. So last year, because the bird flu outbreak was so unprecedented, there was just a lot of concern that anyone within the seabird colony might be increasing the risk. So um, in Scotland in particular, we, we all came out of the colonies and all our work was stopped. So that, that did mean that we weren't then able to monitor what was happening with the birds. And that's a, particularly a problem for the storm petrels. Obviously, we, we don't really see them. It's not like a gannet, which you can see if they've died, you see them on the surface of the colony, or you might even see them at sea. Um, if a storm petrel is affected, you just won't know. So things will hopefully be a bit different this summer. Obviously, we're hoping that, that bird flu won't be an issue, but I suspect that it will still be causing problems. Um, but we're much more prepared now. And um, Several of us within the science team have been trained up or are being trained up to take samples from birds um, for testing. So testing for antibodies. So how prevalent is bird flu within populations? Um, and we'll also be doing lots of seabird censuses this summer to see what the impacts have been. So, yeah, watch this space. We don't yet know, but we're hoping for not too much bad news. Brilliant. Thanks, Zoe. That was, yeah, it's it's really interesting to know. And obviously, you know, everything involved in HPAI has just been horrific. And I know a lot of the field workers and uh, reserves and, and, you know, people out and about have been hugely affected by it. So, um, yeah, just thank you. Um, so I think that's all we've got time for. So just a huge, huge thank you for everyone for joining us this afternoon. I hope you found this as interesting and informative as I have. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's going to be a short survey that will pop up on your screens once this webinar is closed. And we would really love to hear your feedback so we can improve events like this in the future. Um, and it just leaves me to say a huge thank you to Laura and Zoe for their amazing talks. It, yeah, it's just been absolutely um, fascinating and hearing about all the work and um, all that you're doing. And just thank you for everything that you do as well. It's it's incredibly important. Um, so we hope you've enjoyed our Wild Owls webinar series. Um, all the webinars have been recorded and they will be available soon on the events YouTube channel. So once they're ready, we will send you all the links so that you can go back and have a listen to it. And please do share with your friends as well if anybody wants to hear about these talks. Um, so just a thank you to everyone and have a really lovely rest of your day.